Well, good morning, church. And I just want to, can we give a hand to the tech team? It was a crazy morning this morning. You know, it takes a lot of work to get a camera pointed at the baptisms and then onto the screen. I don't understand any of it, but our tech team is amazing. And so even when there's hiccups, you guys rock. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Before I dive into the message, uh, you know, Baptism Sunday is such a special Sunday because it's that reminder of what happens, the reality that happens when we come to faith in Jesus and believe in Jesus. Baptism is that symbol of an inner reality where all of our sin has been washed away. We are buried with Christ, Paul says in Romans 6, and rise again into new life. And just before I dive into the message, I just, I just wanted to give an opportunity because I know we have people here who maybe you've never made a decision to believe in Jesus before. You know, John 3.16 says that God sent his only son uh, into the world, that whoever believes in him may have life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. John 4, 1 John 4 talks about how this is love, that God sent his son. Not that we deserved it, but God sent his son. It's this idea that sin, sickness, evil in the world causes this divide between us and God, but God gives us this opportunity to be restored to relationship in him. So before I even say anything and dive into the message and look at what it means to be uh, part of the unveiled kingdom of God, if I can just get everyone just to close your eyes, bow your heads for a moment. And I just want to give the opportunity, if you are here and you have never made that decision to believe in Jesus, but you feel something in your heart, this pull to, to, to believe in Jesus, to receive the free gift of salvation, I just want to give you an opportunity to do so. No, Jesus doesn't demand perfection. He just asks for our love, for our affection. And one of the greatest opportunities in our lives is that we would come to know him and be known by him. And so if you're here and you've never taken that opportunity to believe in Jesus, I'm going to count to three. And when I reach three, if you're like, yeah, I, that's me. I want to I give my heart to Jesus. All I want you to do is slip up your hand and put it right back down. One, God loves you. Two, your life will never be the same. Three, no one looking around. If you want to give your heart to Jesus, just slip up your hand and put it right back down. Come on, come on. Come on. Yes. Come on. All right, you guys can open your eyes. I just saw about six hands go up across the room. Praise God. Come on. I just want to encourage you, if that's you and you made that decision this morning, don't go home without telling someone. Our relationship with God, the first and foremost is that it's a relationship with God, but also it invites us into community with others. And we would love to support you. The people around you would love to support you. Uh, if you go to gateway.ac slash saved, I believe that's the, the webpage, you can let us know. We've got resources. We'd love to help you. But, but really, make sure somebody knows, because faith is meant to be done in community. Awesome. Well, Welcome, church, to week eight of our series that we're calling The Unveiled Kingdom. And you know, this series, quite simply, is a series that is all about pulling back the veil, so to speak, revealing what has been hidden for far too long. Because so often as a church, we focus on aspects of our relationship with God that they're important, but they don't paint the full picture. You know, salvation and believing in Jesus, it's key, it's crucial, but it doesn't paint the full picture of what God has made available to us. That from this foundation of the world, God created the world and created humanity with the purpose of filling the earth with his glory filling the earth with his kingdom. A kingdom that is not about separation and, and, and being different and, and, and standing out in a crowd, but a kingdom that is about God's power manifest on earth. You know, when Jesus walked on the planet, his focus, the focus of his ministry really was kingdom. And the Jews of that day, they, they thought of this kingdom in terms of a geopolitical kingdom. Like, Jesus will be king, he'll raise an army, and he'll fight back the evil Romans, and and it'll be a a kingdom of warfare and domination. 
But Jesus came and proclaimed a kingdom of peace and love. Nowadays, we as Christians, we tend to think of the kingdom as a far off, distant reality. Or we think of it as only existing in heaven. And this idea we get in our heads that the earth is going to hell in a handbasket, as my grandmother would say. The world's just getting worse and worse and worse. We need to avoid the world, separate from the world, and hope we can escape one day as the world just burns. But Jesus never preached about that kind of kingdom. Jesus preached about a kingdom that is both here, it's both now and not yet. It is both present now and growing in society, and it will continue to grow until it fills the whole planet, but it's not yet because the fullness of that kingdom has not yet come. And so this has been the focus of this series, is looking at the words and message and life of Jesus, looking at the theology of the Bible when it comes to the kingdom of God. And over the past couple of weeks, we've been digging specifically into the book of Matthew. We looked at how in Matthew 3, God crowns Jesus as king through his baptism. And how in Matthew 4, Jesus then goes into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, simply to prove to the devil that the devil is powerless. Joy brought us a message uh, the next week about how we are meant to live as people in the kingdom as peacemakers, as salt and light, elevating society around us. We talked about Matthew 6, how Jesus calls kingdom bearers to be people who forsake pride, who forsake their desires, who forsake their needs in exchange for the kingdom. Not that we don't take care of ourselves, but we put God's kingdom first. And last week, Erica brought a fantastic message. How many of you love that message? Come on about how Jesus' kingdom is not just a matter of talk, but of power. See, when Jesus proclaimed the kingdom, if you've read through Matthew, you'll recognize Jesus always proclaimed the kingdom and then demonstrated the kingdom through signs and wonders and miracles. And this is just the reality of God's kingdom. That God's kingdom is greater than anything we could imagine. God's kingdom is different than what we might imagine. God's kingdom is more powerful than we might imagine because God is king and all authority in heaven and on earth belongs to Jesus. But this week, I want to take us a step further because throughout the gospel of Matthew, Jesus talks quite a lot about the kingdom of God. Sometimes he talks clearly, sometimes he talks in riddles, and and today I want to start to dig into some of the parables of the kingdom, these, these stories that Jesus taught about the kingdom that demonstrate eternal truth. And I want to talk to you on the idea, the concept of walking in the kingdom. See, in Matthew chapter 13, we find Jesus, he's kind of at the height of his ministry. Like he, he's at the height of his popularity. People love him. They know Jesus as this great teacher, this great healer. Jesus has done all of these incredible miracles. And they're like, yes, Jesus is amazing. I love Jesus. And crowds are following him everywhere. You know, this is after, this is after Jesus has given his great sermon on the mount in Matthew 5 to 7. This is after Jesus has healed a bunch of sick people in Capernaum. After he's crossed the Sea of Galilee during a storm and calmed the storm with a word. This is after he went to the region of the Gadareans and met this this demoniac, this demon-possessed man who people were terrified of, and in a word he cast the demons out and into pigs. This is after Jesus has gone back to his hometown of Nazareth and and proclaimed the kingdom of God and healed the sick there. This is after all of these miracles have happened and, and the religious elite of the day are like, ah, he's not really Jesus. He's not from God. He's actually a demon lord. And Jesus is like, are you stupid? It's Matthew 12, if I remember right. It's Matthew 11 or 12. I believe it's 12. It's hilarious. I love it. Sassy Jesus. But Matthew 13, we see that there's these massive crowds of people who are following Jesus. They love Jesus. 
but they don't get Jesus. And we know this because often when large crowds start to follow Jesus, that's when Jesus gets really controversial. Because he's interested in seeing who actually is interested, who actually wants to follow me, who's actually willing to pay the price. But Matthew chapter 13, we see Jesus. He is in, I can't remember what town he's in. I believe it's in Nazareth. I could be wrong there. Um, But it says, verse 1, that same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. Now, we don't know exactly why Jesus went out to the beach. Matthew didn't think that was important, so it must not be important to the story. We don't know if he was going out to pray or if he knew this crowd would come and follow him. But Jesus, he steps onto the beach, and the reaction you see from people would be similar to if Taylor Swift or Mr. Beast walked through the doors right now. People are like, oh my goodness, it's Jesus. And you can imagine like the disciples, get, him, get back, get back, give him room. And he's like getting into the boat just to get some space. But people, they love Jesus because they expected him to do something for them. And Jesus, he gets into this boat and he begins to teach them using parables. Now a parable is a short allegorical story. That means it's a short made up story that is used to illustrate an eternal truth. And you see, Jesus, he understood, uh, first of all, that many people listening to him were not, like, the smartest people of the world. Like, I'm not, not being mean to them or anything, but these, were, these weren't the religious elite of the day. These were the poor, rural farmers of the region of Galilee. And so Jesus, he often, when he speaks and when he teaches, he seeks to accommodate our level of understanding. We see this throughout the Bible when it comes to scientific understanding. There's a parable we'll look at in a minute where Jesus says that the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds. Well, science says that's not true. It says it's the orchid seed. But Jesus wasn't interested in portraying scientific truth. He was interested in illustrating a point. And so Jesus, he accommodates these people. And he starts to speak to them and teach them and reveal eternal truth to them through simple, ordinary stories. And we notice throughout the Gospels that when Jesus is in an area that's more agricultural, his parables are all about farmers, fishermen, families. But later on in Matthew, which we'll look at in a couple weeks, Jesus' parables shift from that agricultural setting to being about kings and rulers as he steps into a setting where he's talking to the religious and political elite. Because Jesus always sought to accommodate his audience's level of understanding. But Jesus, he's in this boat, and he starts to speak And he tells them this story. For the sake of time, we're not going to read the story. We'll read what Jesus says about the story after. But he tells them this parable of a sower sowing seed, like a farmer sowing seed. And he says, basically, the kingdom of God is like a man sowing seed in his field. Some of the seed falls on the path and birds snatch it up. Some falls on on rocky soil. And even though it grows, it dies because there's no depth of soil. Some seed falls amongst thorns, he says, and the thorns strangle the seed. But some seed, he says, grows or falls on, on good ground and it grows and it multiplies. And in this setting, remember, Jesus is talking to a bunch of farmers and fishermen. In this setting, Matthew doesn't tell us this, but I can imagine the people sitting there are like, why did we come to Jesus' TED Talk on how to farm? Like, Jesus, if you have so much trouble planting your field, plow your field before you sow the seed. Like, literally, that would have solved all of the problems. Now, I've been... um, I, I, I'm a guy who likes to play a lot of video games, and recently I've been playing a game called Farming Simulator, which is exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> and even I know that if... Ba- this is based on a video game. I have no farming experience beyond that. But, but based on this video game, even I know if there's rocks in your field, it's not going to grow very well. There's weeds in your field. It's not going to grow very well. If the field is too hard, it's not going to grow very well. What's the solution? You cultivate or plow the field. 
And so the crowd is confused, and the disciples are confused, so confused that it says, verse 10, then the disciples came to him and asked him, why do you speak to them in parables? Jesus responds, verse 13, the reason I speak to them in parables is that seeing they do not perceive, and hearing they do not listen, nor do they understand. With them indeed is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah that says, you will indeed listen, but never understand. You will indeed look, but never perceive. For this people's hearts, heart has grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing. And they've shut their eyes so that they may not look with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn. And I would heal them. So the disciples are like, Jesus, why do you speak in these riddles? And Jesus responds by quoting Isaiah 6. And in Isaiah 6, God is speaking to Isaiah, and God tells Isaiah, hey, I need you to declare this message to Israel. And you're going to go, and you're going to declare that message, Isaiah, but they're not going to listen to you. It's kind of like, why are you sending me then, God? And God says, the reason they're not going to listen to you is because they've been ignoring my voice for so long, they don't even know to recognize it anymore. And it's this dire warning that it's easy for us to come to this place where we've ignored God's voice for so long that we don't even recognize it. But within the warning is a promise. If they turn, they will be healed. And in the Hebrew... Of Isaiah 6, the wording for healed, it's not about physical healing. It means that their relationship with God will be restored. They will be reconciled to God. So Jesus says, this crowd that's following me, they don't get it. I speak to them in parables because they do not understand. They've been ignoring God's voice for so long, they don't get what I'm saying. But if they did if they listened, if they hear and obey, then they will be reconciled to God, just like they want. And from there, Jesus goes on, and he begins to explain the parable of the sower. He says, verse 18, Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. So notice, the parable of the sower, what is happening? Well, Jesus is saying that someone, or someone likely him, is scattering seed, which is the kingdom. But some of the seed falls on hard soil. And because the soil is not receptive to the word of the kingdom, the seed is stolen. And Jesus, in this parable, he is expressing four different responses to the kingdom of God. First is where he, he speaks and you hear his word and you're like, no, nah, I'm good. And this is a reality we see all across the world with people who don't believe in Jesus. You know, in Romans 1, it talks about how God's eternal qualities and divine nature has been seen by everyone so they are without excuse. That God has revealed himself in his creation. Everyone has the opportunity to encounter God whether they come to a church or not. But so many people, their hearts are hard, and when they hear the message of the kingdom, they reject it, and the seed is stolen. And then Jesus goes on, verse 20, As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. So this is, the seed is sown, but the seed falls on a heart that won't root properly. The seed is susceptible. Because you're not rooted in God's word. You're not rooted in the reality of who Jesus is. And when, you, you, when you're not rooted properly in God, the second a problem arises, well, you're out of here. Because it's not worth it. So we have seed that is stolen and we have seed that is susceptible. Verse 22, as for what was sown amongst thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the cares of this age and the lure of wealth choke the word and it yields nothing. So those who receive the word, believe the word, but then get too distracted by what's going on in their lives and what they want. 
Literally, Matthew 6, when Jesus tells us, do not worry about your life, the word for worry is the same word that is used here for the cares of the world. Jesus is saying, do not worry because worry will strangle what I want to do. Worry and lust will strangle what I want to do. Verse 23, but as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. So Jesus is teaching this simple principle that there are four responses to hearing about the kingdom of God. You have the heart that is hard, and so the seed is stolen. You have the heart that doesn't actually care enough to get grounded properly in Jesus, and so the seed is susceptible. You have the heart that is so distracted by the lusts of the world and the worries of life that the seed becomes strangled. But then you also have the heart that focuses on the kingdom, that seeks first the kingdom, and so it becomes successful. And you know what's fascinating with this passage is it talks about bearing much fruit. And the Greek word that's used for fruit there is a word that very often in the Bible and outside of the Bible is used as a metaphor for works. Which tells me that this isn't just about believing in Jesus and being saved, but this is about following Jesus. This is about Jesus speaking. You hear his voice, you listen, and you obey. And I believe what Jesus is teaching us in this parable is that the kingdom of God will only grow in your life to the extent of your willingness to hear and obey the voice of God. See, so often in our lives, it's easy for us to hear God's voice and then be distracted. You know, one of the core theological truths, one of the core truths of the Bible is that God loves us and wants a relationship with us. And relationship requires communication. We all have the opportunity to hear God's voice. There's many day, different ways we can hear it, but we all have the opportunity as God's children to hear his voice. But many of us, we never listen, so we can't obey. And many of us, we listen, but the second that life gets difficult, or the second that we get distracted, or the second that God says something that we don't want him to say, and he calls us out on sin that we don't want to give up, we stop listening. I know that's not you, that's just me. But God's kingdom will only grow in fertile soil. God's kingdom will not grow in your life if you are not willing to listen and obey to his voice. But if you are willing to listen, to receive, to obey, to do what he tells you to do, to, to follow his leading, to follow his voice, he will lead you to produce great fruit, to multiply, to expand his kingdom in your life and in the lives of people around you. But then Jesus goes on. And he starts to tell this second parable about a man who sowed good seed in his field, but then late at night, an enemy came and sowed bad seed in the field. And, and in this parable, the, this man, the landowner, he has servants who come. And they're like, there's weeds in the field. I thought we sowed wheat. I thought we sowed good, good, good seed. And how did this happen? And, and the, the landowner's like, well, an enemy must have done this. And they're like, well, should we rip up the weeds really quick? And the landowner says, no, 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 no. Because if you do so, you'll rip up the wheat as well. Leave it, and at the harvest, I will divide it. And you see this, Jesus here, he's using this parable that actually happened in the ancient world. Like there are literal laws in Roman law about if you have a, if you have a farm and a neighbor has a farm and one of you sows poisonous plants in the field, there's a law about that in Roman law because it happens so often. It's like you didn't like your neighbor, so when they went and planted their, fee, or their food, you went and you planted some weeds in there. Poisonous plants. And specifically, from the context, we know the good seed is wheat, but the bad seed is a weed known as darnel. And darnel, at a young age, looks a lot like wheat. You can't really decipher between the two. But as it grows older, you can start to tell that's wheat, that's poison. 
But by the time you can tell the difference, the Darnell's roots have intertwined with the wheat's roots. So to pull out the Darnell means you kill the wheat. So again, the disciples are confused. What does this mean? Jesus tells them, verse 37, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. Notice, Jesus is saying, I'm sowing good seed. The seed is you who believe in me, and the field is the world. Not part of the world, the whole world. He says, the weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, the end of time, and the reapers are angels. For just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers. Notice, we always think of this as all people. He doesn't just say people. He says all causes of sin, all evildoers. And they'll be thrown into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let anyone with ears listen. And Jesus here is teaching a principle that's not very politically correct. But you know, Jesus is never concerned with political correctness. He's concerned with truth. And he's telling us that those who believe in him are like seed that he scatters in the world. But those who don't believe in him are like seed that the enemy, the devil, scatters into the world. Now there's opportunity, we know, this is separate from the parable, there's opportunity for those who don't know Jesus to come to know Jesus and to enter into his kingdom, but we know that a lot of people won't. And so Jesus, he's using this parable to illustrate that at the end of time, there will come a day when Jesus will return and he will separate out the righteous from the unrighteous. The righteous will shine like the sun in his kingdom as heaven and earth become one, but the unrighteous will perish. They will not receive the gift of life. It's not politically correct. It's not popular in our culture because we like to focus on human happiness. And we like to focus on love, but it is Bible. And we cannot redefine God to fit our culture because if we do, then we are making God in our own image and we're no longer serving the God of the universe. We must always surrender until our view, our perspective lines up with God's word. And Jesus is just painting the simple picture of what's going to happen at the end of time. But notice, in this parable, Jesus says, The good seed, the wheat, is sown into the field. He doesn't say then that an enemy comes and sows the bad seed in a neighboring field so it's an eyesore. He says that the wheat and the weeds are intertwined, that they're together. There's no separation. Why do I bring this up? Well, it's because so often we're taught as Christians that we're supposed to be separate from the world. That it should be us versus them, the church versus the politicians or whatever. We need to be separate. And I'm not saying that we should be the same as other people. We should be in the world, but not of the world. But, But the idea that we see here with Jesus is that we aren't supposed to be separating ourselves from other people. There's not supposed to be this separation until Jesus comes. Our job is not to be like, nope, you don't believe in Jesus. You can't be my friend. Oh, you do. Okay, we can be friends. We're supposed to be integrated into society, elevating society. And Jesus is teaching this simple principle here that the kingdom of God is not about separation from society, but about the integration and elevation of society. We're not called to be over here while they're over there and we hold them at arm's length and say, hopefully you come to believe in Jesus. That's not the point. We're meant to be intermingling, stepping in, showing them Jesus so that more and more people can come to faith. So that the kingdom of God can come here on earth. How do we do that? Well, there's a, there's a lot we can do. And we'll talk about that, I promise, in the coming weeks and months of this series and the next and the one after that. Guys, I'm so excited. This year's amazing. We just finalized our 
well, not finalized. We, we, we got the rough idea for the series that's going to go from the end of March to June, and the series that's going to go July, August, and I already know what the series is in the fall. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> but Jesus is teaching us we're not meant to be separate. And really, we see him hammer home this point in the next two parables. Verse 31, he put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Point is, the kingdom of God is like the smallest seed, the most insignificant thing. The powers of the world, they look at it, they scoff at it, they say, whatever, it doesn't matter, it's not going to do anything. But it will grow and grow and grow and grow until it expands and replaces the powers of old. And then Jesus goes on, verse 33, he told them yet another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. You know, yeast is a leavening agent. It's an agent that we use in baking to make things rise. And I did a quick Google search. I've never baked bread before, but I did a quick Google search about it. And I found that for yeast to work properly, there's a number of steps. Now, don't take this as how to bake bread. I have no idea what I'm talking about. I just know the science that I read online. Um, but for yeast to work, it first has to be activated. Because if you just put dry yeast straight into the bread, it's not going to do anything. And then for yeast to work, it has to be mixed throughout the bread. Because if you just have a clump of yeast over here, that's going to be gross bread. And then the last step for yeast is that you have to let it rise. You have to let it grow. You have to let it expand. You have to let the, the dough rest for hours so that the chemical reaction can happen and the, the yeast will release CO2, which causes the bread and the dough to puff up, which makes it actually tasty. And Jesus is using this idea of yeast to illustrate how his kingdom works. It starts small. Jesus is the one who has activated the kingdom. Jesus is the one who is bringing, who brought it into the world and has given us the, the, the job of now expanding it throughout the world but it's going to take time. It's not a process of, boom, there we go, done, all right, everyone's saved, all right, let's all go to heaven now. It's a process of growing and expanding. But the promise is the day is coming when the kingdom will fill the whole earth and then the heaven will come down and we'll have the new heavens and the new earth. Point again being, the kingdom of God is not about separation, it is about integration and elevation. Yeast elevates. Yeast grows, it expands, it fills, it transforms. Just as Joy mentioned a few weeks ago in Matthew 5, we are meant to be salt and light. Salt preserves and enhances, and light pushes back darkness. We are not meant to be kingdom-minded people who kind of focus only on heaven and ignore the earth. We are meant to be people who are integrated in society making the world a better place. It's not about us versus them. It's about what God is doing here and now through us. But then Jesus, he goes on and he tells us a few more parables. There's one parable at the end of this chapter that I'm not actually going to read because it's similar to the, the weed and the wheat. It's about fishermen who fish in the Sea of Galilee and they gather fish that are, are edible and fish that are poisonous and they separate them out. The, same, the point is still the same as we're not supposed to be separate, but there will be a day when God separates. But Jesus tells us, verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and reburied. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. And these two parables, they both have the same point. The first parable is about 
what likely how Jesus is describing this man who finds the treasure is as if he is a poor indebted servant. He's not a rich landowner. He doesn't have a lot. He's, pro- he's, not, he's clearly not working on his own land because he has to sell his stuff and buy the land. But basically the parable is, it was very popular in their day because similar to us being like, oh, what if I won the lottery? They're like, oh, what if I found treasure in the ground? The story is that this guy, he comes, he's digging in the ground. He's probably farming on behalf of some rich landowner. He finds treasure. And in that day and age, the law was, it wasn't finders keepers. It was wherever the treasure was found, whoever's land it was on, that treasure belonged to the person. So this person, he hides the treasure and he goes because he knows this treasure is so valuable. He sells everything he has so he can buy the field and possess the treasure. The point is the kingdom is so valuable. It is worth more than anything we have. And similarly, we see the merchant who would be a man of great wealth. He's in search of this fine pearl. Likely he's found hundreds and thousands of pearls, but none of them satisfy. And he finally finds the kingdom. He's like, this is worth more than anything else I have. And he sells everything to possess the one. And just, Jesus is just pointing out a simple reality. The kingdom of God is worth more than anything we might possess. You know, the kingdom of God will only grow in your life to the extent of your willingness to listen and obey the voice of God. The kingdom of God is not about separation from society, but about the integration and elevation of society. And the kingdom of God must become a priority if you are going to see it in your life. You see... So often we think of our relationship with Jesus as if it's kind of just a one one simple thing. Like believe in Jesus and you'll be saved. That's true. That's crucial. And so often in church, we talk about our our relationship with God as if it's a three-step process. Like believe in God, get your act together and start serving. And those things are all important because when, you are, when you're connected with God, you will naturally start to deal with sin. Your life should start to reflect the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It should happen. If it's not, it tells me that your relationship with God isn't as strong as it needs to be. But beyond what we can do for God, there is a depth of relationship that God wants to have with you that goes beyond your wildest imaginations. There's a place that God wants to bring you in in your relationship with him where it goes beyond serving him and, and, and doing the right things and living a holy life. It goes beyond just reaching the world. It goes to having intimacy with the Father. The kingdom of God is about, is not just about going out and spreading the kingdom. That's important. But it's also about Intimacy. God wanting to know you and be known by you. God wanting to speak to you, to guide you, to lead you, to love on you. To bring you to a place where you and him become one and your will becomes his. But you know, the kingdom of God is always dependent on our obedience. See, God is a gentleman. He will not force himself on you. You have to choose to let him in. God will not force himself on you. You have to choose to let him in. And that goes beyond salvation. Some of you might have been saved for 20 years and you've let God into the, the like entryway of your house, but he wants to, to commune with you. He wants to be with you. And God is looking for people who would be willing to listen, to obey, to take time, to put, make a priority what he prioritizes. 
He's not just looking for us to push and expand his kingdom out there. That's important. But he's also looking to grow his kingdom inside of us. But we have to be willing to let him in. I read a quote by a guy named Ed Silvoso this past week. He said, without God, we can't. But without us, God won't. Because he's chosen to limit his power to our obedience. And so the question is, will you be someone who doesn't listen to God's voice at all? Will you be someone who listens to God's voice when it's convenient and then stops when it's not? Or will you be someone like the prophet Samuel in 1 Samuel, where God speaks from him and he is confused and he runs to, to his mentor. He's like, do you called me? And the mentor's like, no, 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 I didn't call you. And it goes back and forth a couple times. And finally he realizes that it's God's voice and God speaks to him. He calls out Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel responds, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Will we come to a place where our relationship with God, intimacy with God, is the priority of our lives? Because I believe that God wants to do something in your heart, in your life, in your family, in your sphere of influence, in your business, in your workplace, with your grandkids. God wants to do something in and through you but it starts with you. It starts with intimacy with him. So as we close, I just want to encourage us to take a moment to listen to our Father. See, I mentioned this earlier, but I, we believe as a church that God speaks. He's not a distant Father who's like, Believe in me, do the right things, and I'm never going to talk to you. He's not distant or removed, but he's intimate and close, and he wants to know you. And as such, God speaks to you. He speaks in many different ways. Sometimes it's an audible voice. I've never experienced that, but I know people who have. Sometimes he speaks to us through our sanctified imaginations, just into our minds, where we have thoughts that are not our own that come from God. God can speak to us through scripture. He can speak to us through other people. He can speak to us through his creation. But the point is, God speaks to us. And he wants to have a relationship with us. But whenever God speaks, the key is that his voice will always be loving. 1 John 5 tells us God is love. God's voice will always be loving. If it's not loving, it's not God. Second, it will always glorify Jesus. Third, it will always be in line with Scripture because God will not contradict himself. But I just want us to take a moment and receive from God. And quite simply ask God these two questions. Say, God, in what place have you positioned me to serve as an example of you? Could be your family, could be your workplace, could be when you go to the grocery store tomorrow, well, or yesterday. And then ask him, Jesus, how can I better demonstrate your love and power in that particular space? So we're just gonna take a minute. And I just want you, like, if you need to, close your eyes, bow your head, do whatever you need to do to, to just connect with God. But ask God these questions and let him speak to you. Let him lead you.
See, we're all ministers. Whether you have a fancy title, call the pastor, work in a church, or work in a coffee shop, it doesn't matter. We are all ministers. God wants to do something in and through your life that will change everything around you. Something that will start with you, that will then overflow to transform your family, transform your friend group, transform your workplace, transform your, your sphere of influence. And ultimately, as God does it in all of our lives, transform our city. But it starts with our obedience. So I'd encourage you, whatever God said to you here, be courageous and do it. Doesn't matter if it's easy or hard. Doesn't matter if, if it's like, oh yeah, that's simple. I can do that in three minutes. Or it's like, oh my goodness, God, that's going to take me three years to pull off. I feel like there's somebody here that God told you that he wants you to start a business. And you're like, oh my goodness, God, that's terrifying. Don't you see the state of the economy? Well, if God's in it, it doesn't matter what's in the world because he's going to take care of you. I just encourage you, whatever God tells you to do, let us be people who will listen and obey. That we will see God's kingdom grow in our hearts, in our lives, and then spread and expand to transform our city and our nation and our world. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, I thank you that you are good and you are God. I thank you that in your sovereign wisdom, you didn't decide to be a God who just unilaterally did whatever he wanted and forced people into relationships with him, but that you gave us free will, that you chose to give us the option of serving you, of following you, of being kingdom bearers. God, I thank you that you love us so much that each of us is uniquely gifted and positioned in a place that we don't even know yet so that we can transform the world for your glory. Lord Jesus, I just pray that this week will be a week marked with intimacy with you where we go deeper in our relationship with you than ever before, but also that it'll be a week that is marked by transformation in the world around us that we will be people who go out and through simple acts of kindness, simple acts of obedience, simple acts of blessing people through prayer, through word, through deed, that we would serve as your example and demonstrate your love and your power here on earth. God, I just pray over all of us that we would have hearts that were open to receive the fullness of your kingdom ears that were open to listen to your voice and, and just hearts that would be willing to obey no matter what you say. That God, as you transform us inside, as we go deeper in intimacy with you than we could ever imagine, as we learn what it means to sit in the arms of our daddy God, to be held in your loving arms, not at arm's length, not being judged, but just to be loved on by you. God, help us from that place of intimacy to then go out, be obedient to you, and see our world transformed on earth as it is in heaven. Pray this in your holy, holy name.